Telemachus arrives in Pylos to find King Nestor sacrificing 81 bulls to Poseidon and hosting a feast for 4,500 people. Athena, under the guise of Mentor, is encouraging and helping Telemachus. Telemachus and Athena are welcomed warmly by Nestor's son, and after their meal, Nestor asks them who they are. Telemachus asks Nestor for news of his father, Odysseus, and Nestor recalls the living hell of Troy. Nestor tells Telemachus of the disaster that was the Achaean army returning home from Troy. Telemachus tells Nestor of the plight of the suitors, and Nestor replies that Athena's favor for his father, Odysseus, is incredibly important, as Athena sits there in the guise of Mentor. Telemachus asks Nestor to tell the story of how Agamemnon died, and Nestor tells of how Agamemnon was betrayed by his wife and murdered. As the conversation turned to returning to Nestor's hall, Athena, disguised as Mentor, transforms into an eagle and flies away. Nestor explains to Telemachus what favor he must have had with the goddess and prepares a splendid sacrifice to Athena in her honor. He has a heifer's horns sheathed in gold, and Athena returns pleased with this sacrifice. The book ends with them obeying Athena's orders by preparing a chariot to take Telemachus to Menelaus in Sparta. Welcome to Ascend, the Great Books Podcast. We are back for book three of the Odyssey in which we get to find our boy Nestor. It's very sad that Adam Minahan is not here tonight because Nestor was his favorite character working through the Iliad. And so once again, I am pleased to be joined by Dr. Frank Grabowski, a professor of philosophy at Roger State University, and our good dear friend Thomas Lackey. Welcome. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, people can't see you wave on the podcast, so you have to you have to say something. You gotta <laughs> you know say hello or you know do something like that. So very good. So Thomas, before we get into like book three, um, I kind of want to put you on the spot a bit because you are a first time reader of the Odyssey, right? This is your first time to read through the text. So book three, we're about to get to Nestor. Like, how do you find the text so far? Is it what you expected, and how do you feel it? Uh, compares to the Iliad? Uh, so I would say no, it's not what I expected. Um, in that, while I've, ne- I've never read the Odyssey, but like a lot of people, you can't help but pick up uh, much of the story of the Odyssey, and we always hear about the Cyclops and the various islands, and I won't give away too much in case someone actually hasn't heard those stories, but I, in all cases, the story generally picks up with Odysseus. And so the big shock when you pick up the text with you know fresh eyes is, of course, find out that that's not, not where you start at all. And you don't, in fact, get there for quite a while. So I'd say that's not, not what I expected. Um, I, this is my first time reading through the Iliad as well. And uh, I would say what, what I found most intriguing about the Iliad was the question of providence, really, if we mm. pass it in somewhat Christian terms. The, the interaction between um, men and the gods and man's place uh, vis-a-vis the gods, right? So I think there's still some of that going on here. But I think to me the stronger contrast, and I'll borrow an image from the Iliad, is the, the contrast put on the shield of Achilles that Hephaestus makes between the, the kind of the two cities, the city at war and the city at peace. And the city at peace is not conflict free, right? There's trials, there's uh, uh, dangerous animals, there's work. Um, and by, by trials, I mean literally trials, as in there's trials in, in court and uh, murders and things like that. If the Iliad is the city at war, the Odyssey represents in some real sense, at least you know so far, and I think this will this bears out over time, the city at peace, which is hmm. its own, but with its own adventures and its own intrigues, right? It's not it's not um, it's not dull by any stretch. It's 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 just a different sort of uh, it's a different side of life. 
and a, and different trials to be faced. And I would, so I'd say that would that's my impression so far. I think the the overwhelming impression of these is of this uh, image of Achilles' shield, and we've we've kind of moved to the other side of the shield, if you will. Yeah, that's an interesting take. I would need to to think about that because it should be noted, right, that the the city of peace is not without conflict. Yes, right. Yeah. That the city of peace has a way to resolve the conflict because, if I recall correctly, the city of peace is characterized by the marriage, right, and all the rites and festivities around it, and then also by basically the court, right. That there's been this conflict in the marketplace, and there's this way that it can actually be resolved. So that's, that, that's an interesting uh, comparison. Okay, King Nestor remembers. We'll get into book three, get this launched. Where I'm excited to see Nestor again. I mean, you know, I'm surprised in certain ways that he is still alive because the Iliad makes him sound ancient, right? I mean, he is the link to the time before when men were actually men. That's one thing I love when you read about this. Like these guys are fighting with spears and shields and doing things that seem so, you know, masculine and spirited to us. And then Homer's like, yeah, well, this isn't when men were men. That that was an age ago, right? Now men are weaker now, right? And I, I love those lines from the Iliad where it's like, and he picked up a big boulder as weak as men are now, right? So Nestor is this, this uh, you know, character who's the, the link to this age. He was old enough to be, he was the oldest chieftain king in uh, the Iliad for the Achaean side. And now he is still alive. That was my bigger shock when I actually read the Odyssey and turned to book three that he, Nestor, is still kicking it. So he's still here. And um, I then I just find this book endearing because, you know, they ask him questions and they literally get the, he gets to tell stories. Like he gets to do what he's been wanting to do all the whole time. Like he finally gets to tell some stories. I feel like in the Iliad, like everyone was trying to get away from his stories Right, he's just like, well, let me give you this unsolicited story about when I was young, or when Hercules murdered my family, or whatever it is. And here, like, Telemachus is actually asking him for the story, and I just think he eats it up and loves it. So, that commentary, we start book three. So we do see that Telemachus um, and uh, Athena, under the guise of mentor, show up to the beaches of Pylos, and what we see here is like there is a massive feast going on. And I do think it's notable that this is to Poseidon, who we know is currently raging against Odysseus. I don't think that's, you know, on accident. And so we have this feast to Poseidon in which there are 81 bulls being sacrificed to Poseidon. And then you know how the sacrifices work is that there's the parts that they give to the god and then there's the parts that they keep for themselves and the parts they keep for themselves become this kind of communal feast. And it just so happens that the parts they get to keep for themselves are the good parts that you get to eat, right? And there's a whole myth, if you remember, we talked about it on the podcast before, of Prometheus is the one that tricked Zeus into accepting the worst part of the sacrifice so men could keep the good part. And since Zeus, uh, once he ascends in his will, cannot change, then he can actually be tricked and for the betterment of mankind. And so, but I do think on a, on a you know, on a skeptical side of that, I would point out that even in their sacrifices and their relationship between man and the gods, uh, the Greeks have deceit and trickery, right? Which I think is something that's that's notable. But on the other hand, you know, I would push that, you know, religion is a natural virtue, right? We naturally want to uh, give God his due. We understand there's something larger than us, even by nature. And so this plays out, that natural religion plays out in a lot of different ways, and so I do think it's really interesting to note that even in this kind of like more primal religion and the sacrificing of the bulls, that their sacrifices always have a vertical character and a horizontal, right? So there's a part gets given up to the gods, but then that sacrifice to the gods, that kind of divine act, always then also precipitates a feast. It precipitates a horizontal kind of communal aspect uh, of friendship. And it's something I, I do appreciate I think has a lot of um, foreshadowing into, you know, finally the the blessed sacrament. And we, we see that ultimate sacrifice that also then is in the context, right, of a feast uh, and also is communal. So Nestor is kicking off this, um, you know, sacrifice, this festival, if you will, to Poseidon. And this is the context in which Telemachus and Athena uh, come into the picture. I will note... Um, just right here at the beginning, 
I'm not sure if either one of you are familiar, let me know if you are, with the theory that because of the popularity of Homer in the Greco-Roman world, right, even though the Aeneid was probably the most popular text at the time of Christ, but because of the popularity of Homer in the world, that the gospel writers intentionally compared Christ to some of these Homeric passages because they knew that their Greek audience understood uh, these Homeric passages as kind of the templates for who a hero actually was. Are you guys familiar with this at all? Oh, it's, a, it's an interesting theory. I have not dug into it a lot. And obviously it has a poor scholarship that then, uh, you know, denies the inspiration of scripture and that they're copying things and et cetera. But on the human side of like, you know, are the gospel writers trying to call our attention to certain Homeric things and maybe even critique them and say, this is a true picture of this. One of the things they always point to is actually Nestor here feeding the almost 5,000. And so he's got this big feast that he has, uh, which has both, like I said, the divine and the fraternal uh, element. And they they kind of mentioned that this would have been back in the back of the mind of the reader, right? If they're reading about Christ feeding the 5,000, like this would have been a natural comparison for them uh, to make. And there's another one deeper into the Odyssey um, in which, you know, we see one of the heroes of the text uh, become known by his wounds, right? The hero actually is, his identity is tied to the person in front of him understanding his wounds. And obviously there's a, there's a deep analog there, um, you know, to St. Thomas uh, before our Lord. So it's, it's interesting. It's something that I haven't dug into a whole lot, but it's something that now that I've been exposed to, as I go through the Odyssey, I'm kind of flagging these passages that that mm. might have comparisons to the biblical text. Because even broadly speaking, um, you know, I think the relationship between the Greek culture and the Hebrew culture, right, which came together, that Greek reason and Hebrew faith that came together and kind of tilled the earth for the reception of Jesus Christ, the fact that there are comparisons there and things to be made, I, I think are not uh, on accident, if that makes well, sense. Lewis certainly brings up the idea, you know, there, there have been criticisms. I mean, these sometimes criticisms are not new of him basically pointing to the various episodes of the Gospels and saying, well, that's just like, and then fill in the blank, ancient myth. And his uh, realization slash rejoinder that that's, that's not proof against the Gospels, but might in fact be suggestive for them right that there that you have the shadow and then yeah, the shadow and the type and then the truth you have the true myth as it were um right. which is something that tolkien brings up as well really well at the uh last part of his essay on fairy stories that we have in in the gospel um as sort of as it were the great fairy story not that it's false but it's great precisely because it's true right yeah, that kind of myth, that mythic language uh, that where myth there doesn't mean false, um, you know, or untrue, but rather that it's a communication of symbols, right? It's a symbolic speech that communicates very actually deep and primordial truths. And so, yeah, it's just it's an interesting theory to me. Um, it's I've I've dug into it a little bit. It's something that, that I'm watching as I move through the Odyssey to see if there are any of these kind of gospel comparisons uh, to Christ. Not entirely sure what to do with them yet, but I think it's it's a note of intrigue for me. So moving on, so what we see then is they're on the beach. They have um, this festival, if you will, the sacrifice to Poseidon. We see Athena playing that mentor role, right, where she's telling Tem Telemachus, "Hey, no more shyness. This is not the time, right? Why did we sail here? You have to need to go ask Nestor about, you know, your father." And so very much still playing that father figure. Uh, to Telemachus and getting him to actually have be that spirited and have that courage. And so, you know, he moves forward. Uh, the prince replies, you know, how can I do this? Someone my age might feel shy. You know, what's more, you know, me interrogating an old man. You know, and Athena responds like, you know, you, least of all I know, were born and reared without the God's good will, right? I mean, this is like a, that is a heavy uh heavy statement right well i, I think this whole scene is quite funny actually because he she's like just go straight up to him he's like but what do i say there's this almost mm -hmm. if you're go borrowing in this teenage kind of analogy you can almost imagine a teenage boy wanting to go talk to a girl 
He's like, and, right. and his, his friend's like, go, 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 go talk to her. And it's like, but, but what do I say to her? You know, it's almost that scene right here. And I, I like Athena's like, look, some things you've got to figure out for yourself. I mean, that's literally the, in the translation I'm using. It, the exact words are, there are some things you'll figure out for yourself and others you'll have divine guidance. And then she just leaves, right? So, <laughs> right. which is, I, I, I don't know if he is fully aware that Mentor is Athena at this point. Um, well, he, he is. is he, I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, he's you already... He is? You think he is? I think, I, think in, I think in book two, well, I mean, I think as early as book one, I mean, once once she instills confidence in his Thumas, um, I mean, he recognizes that there is divine dealings afoot. Can I can I push back on that just a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I just this is just my gut reaction as I read the text because I took this as he doesn't know that it's Athena. And um, okay. we, won't, we won't jump ahead because he there's some dialogue that happens that I, I doesn't make sense to me if he knows it's Athena. And when he when he says that line, um, Athena is actually presented there as Mentis, not as Mentor. Okay. Fair enough. So Fair enough. I might... yeah. the, the passage I'm thinking of is where uh, Athena and, uh, sort of bolsters his Thumas, and the poet says. He felt his senses quicken, overwhelmed with wonder. This was a god. So perhaps he does not know who, which god has been supporting him. But he's 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 certainly clear. It seems that there is uh, some divine assistance that he's been receiving. Yeah. No, I think we need to keep that in our mind, and um, maybe kind of keep that as a as a question as we move through the dialogue and of where his knowledge actually is, because that's a big question in the Iliad, right? was right. always an individual's I always took it as a, a sign of their maturity and closeness to the gods that they could actually tell the gods when they were in their guise. Right. Right. Um okay. And one other thing I want to comment oh, on it today. Um you know in that one that one passage uh where she says to Telemachus, she reassures him, some of the words you'll find within yourself and the rest some power will inspire you to say. I mean here again I think Fagel's re- kind of drops the ball when he renders the Greek as power. Um, in in the Lattimore translation, um, uh, Lattimore translates it, I believe, as divinity. In the Greek, it's 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 an interesting word. It's, it's daima, which is, if you're familiar with the story of Socrates, the da- daemon is the little whatever. I mean, it's hard to really oh, know what's happening here, yeah. but it's the it's it's the spirit or the conscience. I don't think is the right word. It's it's something divine, but it's what tells Socrates not to do. And so, in the Apology, when Socrates is defending himself, he says, "Look, I came here because my daemon did not prevent me from doing so." So, you know, I don't know where else in Homer uh, we encounter this word, but I do think it's rather interesting that Homer elects to use this particular term to dis- to to refer to the power or the divinity that is going to be channeling words or channeling ideas into Tel- uh, Telemachus. Yeah, I wonder, you know, because the daemon, right, that plays a huge role in Plato's Symposium as well. Yes, it does. Right, um, and because as you know, when Diotima, the kind of female character in there that actually taught Socrates about Eros, which is a whole other fascinating aspect of it, you know, her initial thing when she gets into the myth is that he is a daemon, right? That's mm-hmm. that's what Eros actually is. So that is really fascinating. That I can see why Latimer translates that as divinity because the daemon I've never taken. No, see, the the danger is right is that. We always think of like Homer and the Greeks of, as being somewhat <clears throat> monolithic mm-hmm. when there's really like this three, four hundred year gap between them. So it's kind of like how like when we don't we don't really translate Thumos in the Odyssey as um, like a soul. Right. Because it's just it's too robust of a term yet. They haven't gotten there. So I wonder, though, because Damon about what that understanding is there, because Damon, I've never seen it amongst the classical Greeks where it's just like a power 
or like a, a, a vague thing. It's usually a, like it's almost like a spirit, like a specific spirit, right? The Neoplatonics later will talk about them as angels, right? That they're yeah. actually angel characters. And that's, that's, that's uh, the daemon in the Apology speaking to Socrates, right, is an actual divine spirit. It's like an angel creature that's actually guiding him. That's fascinating. So I've got, uh, I pulled out another translation to look up here, and it, this is Pope's translation. And he says, uh, and others dictated by heavenly power shall arise spontaneous in the needful hour. So th th if you're looking also for, and I, d I don't want to stretch this too much, but gospel parallels, there is uh, the point of the gospel where it, the the people were advised not to try to you know come up with what they would say in the moment of trial ahead of time, but the Holy Spirit would speak to them in that hour and give them the words to say. There is a, I mean, a, at least a kind of resonance here between those those thoughts. No, there's a strong parallel there. No, I thank you, Doctor Grabowski, because I I think <clears throat> that's the problem with translations, right? Is like that line which I I really just kind of passed over. It's so now, fun. Really. Yeah, it just captures my imagination now, right? It just yeah. really captures my imagination of of what that is and how he can have that that spirit. No, that's very good. I like that a lot. The other thing, too, I would say about this passage um, is the kind of irony here that Odysseus' son doesn't know what to say, right? <laughs> like, does that make sense? So, yes. I, I, you know, the, the king of rhetoric, uh, his his son is, is speechless and, and even shy, but I think that this lends then into the seriousness of the fatherlessness that mm -hmm. Telemachus has, has suffered, right? There's no way he should not know what to say. There's no way he shouldn't know how to conduct himself in front of a king or do any of these things. But he does. He, he suffers that because he had to suffer being without a father. Okay, so uh, Nestor welcomes them. We get another kind of beautiful picture here of, of that guest friendship. Um, what is it? What's the Greek word for that again? Xenia. Oh, Xenia. It's like an yeah, it's Xenia, Xenia, I yeah, A, right? Xenia. Yeah, X, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That Xenia, that, that guest <clears throat> friendship. Right. Yeah, so it's um, Nestor's son that actually comes in and uh, welcomes them, says, lifting it, you know, warmly, they give, they're going to give a libation. There's a really kind of fascinating thing here that happens in which obviously it's a feast for Poseidon uh, under guest friendship they were welcomed but then they give this golden cup to Athena to pour out a libation but they see mentor not Athena mm -hmm. and then you get in this fascinating situation in which Athena is asked to pray to Zeus I mean excuse me pray to Poseidon Poseidon yeah and that is that dynamic itself just one god praying to the other under the guise and like how she actually says that, right? Hear me, see Lord, you who embrace the earth. But then there's a whole nother layer here because Athena is actually being very antagonistic towards the will of Poseidon, right? He's still off in Ethiopia. She knows that. And she's doing all these things like trying to help Telemachus and trying to also send Hermes to get Odysseus off of Calypso's island, which all run antagonistically to Poseidon's will. So it's just, I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, what else to draw from it, but it's, it's Homer just stacks on these wonderful juxtapositions in this passage. My um, translation calls this a heartfelt prayer. Uh, does anyone, I mean, this is, these were the lines just ahead of, of the, her invocation. So the, Fagel what, says that she prayed intensely to Poseidon. It's line 61. Yeah, that, 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 that's, yeah, yeah, that was my question. That's a, that's a puzzle. Right, I mean, so there, there's not at least the narrator doesn't suggest that it's an it, it's ironic. Yeah, I don't know if it's like it, it, I, I see. It, I read it less as ironic and more as just like a very odd situation, right? That you get into as a god pretending to be immortal and being asked then to pray to the gods, and then she does it, and then it also happens to be the god that she's antagonistic to. So. Uh, yeah, there's probably something there more that could be dug into, but I, I think it's worth, uh, you know, flagging. And then also the follow-up. Odysseus' yeah. son echoed her back, her prayer word for word. So not only, I mean, I, I wrote out in my notes right there just like quickly, like she's also teaching him how to pray. 
And then we kind of see the typical pattern of guest friendship. They pray, they feast, and then finally it's like, okay, who are you? Right? So we get this kind of wonderful hospitality that the, that the Greeks have. And so Telemachus, who Athena is inspiring, right, says that he is on the trail of his father's widespread fame, great-hearted King Odysseus. And so, you know, which actually then he has a wonderful line on his own father, about 105, where he says, more than all other men, that man was born for pain. Now, Dr. Grabowski, I think we had a conversation, I think, offline, but is this, do I understand correctly that this is a this is a pun or this is a play off of Odysseus's actual yeah, name? Odysseus is a word that is, it's a verb that Zeus uses in book one when describing um, Odysseus. So it's uh, Odysseus, Odysseus. And Odysseus <laughs> means to be hated or to be despised or to be reviled. And so this, again, seems to be part of his character that he that he was destined to be hated. He was destined to experience pain, that this is part of his life story. Huh. Yeah, that is I, I was not aware of that. That is wonderful. So Nestor then, which, again, all, all jokes aside, I think is is happy to tell stories and, you know, play this role. Right. He talks about the living hell uh, that they actually endured, you know, in Troy. And he actually starts telling us then who uh, has died. Right. There Ajax lies, the great man of war. I mean, that was just a punch in the gut. The first time I read that, Ajax was alive and well, and one of the best fighters on the Achaean side. Um, you know, his great shield always like, you know, if you remember, if you guys remember during the Iliad, I mean, he is constantly uh, the last one in the retreat, right? He was constantly <laughs> pushing back or holding the gates or doing something. And multiple times, it was Zeus himself who had to actually do something to get Ajax to actually retreat because his That's own bravery, right, was actually um, impeding whatever the gods were trying to do at that moment. So Ajax uh, has died, obviously Achilles, Patroclus, um, Antilochus, uh, or Antilochus, um, Nestor's own son. He was also alive at the end of uh, the Iliad, and he actually dies during that interim uh, period as well. Do we want to, maybe on Ajax, um, I'm thinking about whether this is the best place to do it. I don't remember if Ajax's story is told. Is Ajax's story told more by Menelaus in Book Four? I no, can't remember. He tells if... the story, I believe, of Little Ajax. He has Little Ajax because I was wondering now if it would be a good time to actually explain what happened to Giant Ajax because I don't remember whether or not they actually ever circle back and tell if his story is actually in the Odyssey. That might be a good thing to do. Yeah, well, I'm more familiar with the story from Sophocles' play. Well, you know, he's dead, so we can't give that part away. We know he's dead. So, okay, so just the, the brief myth um, on Ajax's death, So, which I, I find somewhat ignoble and not fitting of the great and wonderful Ajax. But nonetheless, so if I recall correctly, you have... Um, that Achilles has died, and they're going to then uh, give Achilles armor to the greatest warrior in the Achaean army. Now, this would have been Achilles' new armor, the one made by Hephaestus, which is the one, Thomas, that you were mentioning not too long ago uh, in our opener about the shield of Achilles and etc. And so the two warriors that are picked uh, between the Achaean army are Odysseus and Ajax. And if you remember right, Ajax, at the beginning of the Iliad, was actually explicitly listed by Homer as the second greatest warrior on the Achaean side under Achilles, right? So he really should be uh, the highest warrior now as they think to give this, you know, armor away. But probably because of all of his exploits and everything that he's done, uh, the Achaeans decide to give it to Odysseus and not to Ajax, and so Ajax, you know, this puts him into a spiral because I guess a good way to contextualize this is it's not just like, oh, Odysseus was honored more than I was. It, it goes both ways. It's both an honor for Odysseus and a dishonor for Ajax. And he cannot take 
the dishonor. And I think you can, you know, in the defense of Ajax, I think you can juxtapose everything I just said about him with the fact that he doesn't get the armor, right? So he, how many exploits did he do throughout the Iliad, right, that were vital, right, to the Achaean army? And so he, um, you know, he's raging. And so if I recall correctly, you know, what ends up happening is, is that the gods uh, put a madness on him. And so what ends up happening is, is that he's raging and he's going to kill basically his own soldiers. He's going to kill his own side, right? These guys who don't think he's the greatest warrior, he's just going to kill them. However, the problem is, is that because of the gods trickery, uh, he mistakes uh, the sheep their flocks for his fellow Achaean soldiers. And so he runs out into the field and starts slaughtering the sheep, thinking that he is slaughtering his fellow Achaean soldiers until he finds the old uh, ram, who he believes is Odysseus. He takes it back to his tent, ties it to a pole, and beats it mercilessly. And so, I mean, this is like a, you know, Ajax has just spiraled, right, into this madness and then what he would have done to his fellow soldiers, you know, if they actually, if he was actually seen correctly. And so, and in the midst of, you know, beating this ram uh, tied to his tent pole, uh, his eyes, this this mist is lifted from, lifted from his eyes, and he realizes his shame. He realizes what he has done. And now he has all the rage of being disordered by his uh, fellow comrades, and now the shame of going out and acting like an idiot and slaughtering the sheep and thinking that they're the people and etc., and then also tying a ram to a tent pole and beating it, thinking it's Odysseus. And so he kills himself. He's a suicide. The great Ajax dies by his own hand, which is a, a narrative that I just really did not sit well with me, um, you know, when I first heard that. And so he dies by his own hand, and I, w- one thing I thought was quite notable, because I didn't really understand how the ancient Greeks would take suicide, and so Ajax gives us an insight into that, that he's then denied the funeral pyre, right, which is such a large part of the Iliad, right, with Patroclus, and also with Hector. He's denied the funeral pyre, and he uh, is buried, they just bury him. That's like their less honorable death, right? Is that he's just actually buried in the ground. And so that's it. That's that's the end of, of Ajax. Any thoughts or weeps or that was, a whimper, that was a bang. I know. It just seems so um it just seems so disjointed from who we saw Ajax be in the Iliad. I don't know. I just don't see any I just don't even see any foreshadowing of that. I mean, I could be wrong, and probably because I'm jaded because I enjoyed Ajax throughout the text. But if you kind of think of, like, the Iliad, I don't remember a point of him actually, like, losing his temper or getting mad or getting mad about, like, small honors. Well, I guess it's not small honor, but, I mean, it's like a foreshadowing. And and so for him to get so upset he would kill his comrades that he seemed to be so fraternal with, uh, in the Iliad, and then also kill himself. I don't know. It's not a narrative that sits well with me, but it's a narrative that we have. Well, well there's quite a few things that you could draw. Sorry. Got a little... Hmm. There's a... I mean, you could draw an idea here. Of course, you got the loss of Kleos, and you would have a kind of analogous rage there between Ajax and Achilles, and they're, you know, at the loss of their glory. So, I mean, there, there's something you could maybe, maybe draw on there. Um, also, the blinding aspect of rage, you could look at the, the gods, of course, um, putting this mist over his eyes, but you could also, in a more natural analogy, just the uh, the blinding aspect of wrath. And uh, right. I, does anyone know if the, you know, you have the phrase, um, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Is that a, mm. <laughs> drawn from this? I don't know, because the same thing, I mean, there's a parallel here with Hercules, too, because that was the one way they always got Hercules, right? Is they had to drive him mad, right? Because they couldn't beat him in a in a battle. And so, like, um, they drive him mad, and he kills his family, right? And then that's how he gets into the 12 labors of Hercules, if I recall correctly. Well, you also so have the idea that Odysseus is picked because ultimately it was cunning in the case of the Trojan horse, that uh, the power of Achilles, the power of Ajax, were not able to get them through the walls. They were not able to take Troy. But Odysseus's cunning ultimately allows them to take it. So you have a contrast here between reason and strength. And uh, 
reason becomes honored over strength, and and the result there is a descent for Ajax, not just from strength, but all the way into kind of a, a, a bestialness, right? It's it's unreason at its furthest degree. So the contrast becomes that much stronger. Right. Yeah. It doesn't no. seem quite fair to him, though, right? I will say this much, like... It seems like another case where these things are done to him. Yeah. No, it, it just seems it just seems very disjointed to me. Um, you know, I know when we work through the Greek plays, that's that's one of the ones that we could touch on is with Ajax. The the little Iliad is is it called sometimes? I don't know. I think so. That they not familiar. tells his his fate. It's not yeah. the same as the the regular Iliad, just to be clear. Right. Okay, so kind of moving on, so we're finding out like what happened to some of the characters uh, in the Iliad, and so this is like one thirty. Nestor's going on and, and explaining what has happened. Uh, down about one forty-five or so, we are starting to get examples of the fact that the Achaean return overall was basically a disaster, right? So Troy is sacked, but then when the Achaeans try and go home, uh, this has kind of just been a ubiquitous disaster uh, for everybody. Because he says Zeus contrived in his heart a fatal homeward run for all the Achaeans who were fools, at least, dishonest too, so many met a disastrous end, thanks to the lethal rage of the mighty father's daughter, who would be Athena, who is also sitting next to Telemachus, right? So he's actually talking about Athena while she's actually, you know, sitting there. And so they give this narrative that basically after the fall of Troy and they're going to come back, that Menelaus and Agamemnon uh, got into uh, basically an argument, right, um, about how to appease Athena's wrath. And you basically, I mean, I'll kind of just broadly summarize here. You basically have one group that stays back and is going to make sacrifices, you know, on the beach and before they leave. And you have another group that's going to leave and then make sacrifices, you know, at their first stop, Right. And neither one of these seemed to afford either group a great fortune, right? And Odysseus, in a certain way, tries to do both because he sailed off uh, with the first group and then actually, um, you know, he actually goes back to Agamemnon. So he actually, in a certain way, tries to do both options uh, and also ends up getting the worst share, I think, of the entire situation. Well, it so, can't really be appeased on this point, right? I mean, I think that's another. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that uh, Nestor hints at this that there's no sacrifice that would really be sufficient for the offense that had been given. That's my understanding. Is that it doesn't matter what they did, right? They had she, they had invoked her wrath, and so therefore they're all going to suffer. Now, some don't suffer as much. I mean, Nestor basically just makes it home. To be quite frank, I mean, he doesn't, I don't, Nestor doesn't really have a great suffering. And that's why, you know, he says on 210, he tells Telemachus that basically everything he knows is by hearsay. Right. Because Menelaus, Menelaus got blown off to Egypt and we get his narrative uh, in book four, right? So Menelaus got blown off to Egypt. Uh, Diomedes, I think, has a little bit, but I think he ends up making it back. Obviously, like Agamemnon, we know what happens to. Odysseus, we're trying to figure out what happens to. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. Oh, it says the Myrmidons, you know, make it back. And it actually lists three or four other characters here uh, who do actually make it back. So uh, Nestor is kind of giving us a summary of everyone who came back. And then around, yeah, 220 or so, we get another take on the Agamemnon situation, Right where he's like, oh, you must have heard, you know, what has happened. So again, Homer just uses this again as a guidepost. We're using it as a comparison. Again, he's talking to Limachus. He talks about Orestes, took revenge, you know, the glory that he had. And so this is just kind of becoming a constant parallel to the Odyssey uh, of Odysseus and related to Limachus and Penelope as well. And Telemachus has a really interesting response to this, where you see that he's actually now starting to compare himself to Orestes himself, right? Like he's actually starting to see these parallels. But then he says, and this is why I was mentioning earlier that I don't think he understands fully Athena's favor, because then he makes this line like, if only the gods would arm me in such power, right? And he actually has a greater, um, he, he messes up even more. That's his first mistake, I think. 
where he says, if only the gods would arm me in such power while he's sitting next to the god who's actually empowering him. And then Nestor actually says, by the way, do you know how much Athena cared for your father, Odysseus, right? The bright-eyed goddess, you know, chose to love you just as she lavished care on brave Odysseus years ago, right? I've never seen a mortal show so much affection, you know, again, as, you know, Athena sitting next to him. And Telemachus has about the worst response you could probably imagine in this situation, in which he basically says, never, your majesty, that would never come to pass, I know. What you say dumbfounds me, staggers the imagination, right? Athena's never going to like me like that. She's never going to favor me. She's never going to help me out like that while she's sitting next to him uh, in the guise of mentor. So Athena can't take it, right? She breaks in sharply, her eyes afire. What is this nonsense slipping through her teeth? Which is obviously a famous line from the mouth of Zeus, right? She's mimicking her father here. You know, it's light work for a willing God to save a mortal, right? So she kind of, um, you know, she she kind of pushes back on this, right? The Telemachus needs to understand the favor and what the gods can do. But she also gives this really interesting line about the great leveler is death. Not even the gods can defend a man, not even the one they love, the day when fate takes hold and lays him out at last. The great leveler of things is death. So, um, Mentor, right? Uh, Telemachus responds. Homer actually gives him the adjective wise. It's, on like yeah, two, it is. It's, 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 it's that same, it's that same, that same uh, epithet. What, uh, what was uh, that pep, word again? Pep, pep, it's pep nu menos. And again, it means to be in control of one's faculties. And so, you know, as you mentioned how uh, Athena scolds or chastises Telemachus in the previous paragraph, it's it in a way kind of reminds him or it sets his faculties back in order. So she has to constantly in a way interject that he doesn't have maybe a consistent uh, grasp of his thumas or of his faculties. And so every once in a while she has to come in and crack the whip and get him straightened out. But, but to use, again, to use that adjective wise, to describe Telemachus after, as you described, Deacon, how he has this moment of weakness or weakness of will. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it reminds us that he's not where he needs to be, but that he's getting there slowly. Right. I think there's a there's a reality to his character who has these, you know, sort of waffles between hope and despair. I mean, even within this line, within the translation what I hope for could never happen. So he's on this mission because he's been inspirited to do this. And yet he doesn't, and, and there's another sense of when to, that doesn't expect to see its realization. And um, if you want, this would be, wouldn't be a gospel parallel, but you have a scriptural parallel at least where you have uh, when the, it, it, the Jerusalem is under siege and the prophecy is that the, tomorrow they'll be able to buy you know a bushel of of wheat for you know some small amount of money i don't know what and one of the people says well you know if god should open windows in heaven should this thing be right this is the same like even god couldn't make this happen right um very similar now it ends worse for him to be honest but um i think i think telemachus is given a, a a softer landing yeah so there's a, you know, so again, we're seeing that maturation of Telemachus, right? Even when he's actually lavished and, and given great things, you know, sometimes the adolescent male mind doesn't actually realize, you know, what they have. And so, yeah, the wise thing there is is a funny adjective, right? Epithet. Um, you know, there's an irony to it, but obviously you see Mentor playing out that, that role. So uh, Telemachus then asks Nestor how King Abinanon met his death. Right? How did this actually happen? And so Nestor probably just, you know, tickled to be able to tell a story, right? Uh, basically gives us, and I think you know, Thomas, you laid this out, um, you know, earlier for us. But the um, so we get this story basically of the fact that you know Agamemnon's wife, um, you know, was uh, seduced, if you will, 
And so then basically Agamemnon is, you know, murdered in his own home when he comes home from Troy. I do enjoy as a side note uh, that the bard... Remember we mentioned that the bards, right? The bards are always playing these wonderful roles in the Odyssey. The bard, right, was this wonderful character who was trying to save Agamemnon's marriage um, because he had strict orders to guard his wife, and he's doing his duty. But then, um, what was this guy's name again? Um, what, Aegisthus? Aegisthus, the, yeah. The, yeah. Ship, yeah. Ships him off to a deserted island and maroons him there, right? A sweet prize for the birds of prey. This, this poor bard, right? I just love this motif throughout the Odyssey of the, the wonderful bards that suffer and try and do things. So anyway, so we get the, we get the Agamemnon narrative again, right? And again, these, these parallels uh, both to uh, Odysseus and Penelope and to Telemachus of this kind of journey home. I did find it interesting that Aegisthus, um, he uh, actually makes sacrifices to the gods for what he's doing. Mm. Did you catch that? Like in like 311, that and many thigh bones he burned on the gods' holy altars, many gifts he hung on the temple walls, etc. for his conquest, past, and maddest hopes. So he actually gives thanks to the gods that he's able to overcome Agamemnon's wife and, you know, rule... Uh, and then also, you know, Ag- kill Agamemnon and then rule, um, that would have been what, Mycena, for a short period of time. Because it says, yeah, it's over here in 340, uh, because Menelaus on his journey home, his helmsman is attacked by Apollo. And so he gets knocked off and then there's a hurricane and he's going towards Egypt. And so Aegisthus rules Mycena for seven years. So again, kind of thinking about the the time period here, he actually rules Mycena for seven years. This is like 345 or so. Um, he lorded over Mycena rich in gold once he had killed Agamemnon. He ground the people down. But the eighth year ushered in his ruin because Prince Orestes, home from Athens, yes, he cut him down, that cutting, murderous uh, Aegisthus who killed his famous father, right? The vengeance done, he held a feast for the Argives, to bury his hated mother um, in Craven Aegisthus II the very day Menelaus arrived. Because again, as a reminder, Menelaus and Agamemnon are brothers. So part of the narrative here is why was it not Agam- why was it not Menelaus that sought revenge? And it's like, well, by the time Menelaus could make it home after his odyssey, if you will, over to Egypt and everything else, you know, Orestes had already revenged uh, or avenged his brother. Well, I have a question for you two gentlemen, if I may, at this point. And that is, okay, so let's go back to book one for a moment and and remind ourselves of the speech that, or the excuse or the apologia that Zeus gives on behalf of the gods, right? This is mm-hmm. the, the Odyssey, that it isn't the gods that are responsible for the tribulations of man, but man's recklessness or his foolishness. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking to myself, well, heavens, had Menelaus made it back sooner, um, his brother and his uh, sister-in-law may not have died. That it was the, what, seven or eight year delay, right? I mean, he's delayed a great many years and this allows Aegisthus to carry out the deed of seducing Clytemnestra and with her murdering Agamemnon. And so Zeus does seem to have a hand in all of this, does he not? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I think there's there's a timeline issue there, right? So like, you know, Aegisthus is uh, seducing Agamemnon's wife, you know, while Agamemnon's out in Troy. And then, yeah, if if Athena and, you know, Zeus and et cetera had not been uh, raging at the Achaeans, then theoretically they all would have gone home at the same time, right? And you kind of wonder how that would change the narrative um, with Menelaus and things like this. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's good, it's good to push into that. Um, I think there's another question here, right, about justice that's, that's like at least a burgeoning idea of justice where, you know, we're sort of presaging the euthyphro by a good long while. But 
the, the gods, according to Book One, had warned Aegisthus not to do this, and he persisted anyway. But then offers lavish sacrifices when his plans come off. Mm-hmm. When Athena's commenting on this again in Book One, she says, "Let and may may all perish." that do such things. There's an idea like these sacrifices are completely wasted, not just because the gods are offended, but there seems to be lurking behind that an idea that that a crime, a true crime had been uh, committed and that it was that the gods sided with the avenger of the wrong, not with the wrongdoer and that the sacrifices are completely wasted on them. So I think there's an idea here that like something behind the gods uh, that is in some sense standing over them as justice. Yeah, it's, I wonder. It's very if, um, in the background, mind you. But yeah, I mean, the problem is like, in, in what capacity inside these Homeric tales can you actually get away from divine influence, right? Because like, part of me, I, I don't find Agamemnon a very sympathetic character, right? And so. You know, just because he was a, you know, weak king in Troy certainly doesn't mean that he needs to be killed by his own, you know, family. But at the same time, uh, you know, I, I do recall, as I think uh, Thomas helped us recall earlier, that, you know, Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter. Right. So the 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 original leaving of, um, you know, the Achaeans and being trapped on the island where they're not getting favorable winds and so, therefore, Agamemnon believes he has to sacrifice his daughter to Artemis. I mean, you know, having that human sacrifice, you know, human sacrifice kind of bookends the Iliad, right? It kind of, because you have Agamemnon and sacrificing his daughter, and then you have uh, Achilles sacrificing, I think, if I recall correctly, the 12 Trojans at Patroclus' uh, funeral yeah. pyre. So, you know, you you want to blame Agamemnon to a certain degree because he put his wife, because I'm assuming that she knows, I mean, that is an assumption on my part, but I'm assuming that she knows what happened to her daughter, that she wasn't really married to Achilles. And you want to blame him for that. But at the same point, you know, Artemis made him do that because one of his men killed a rabbit. And so I, you know, at some point that's, that's the thing is like on these Homeric tales, like how much can you extricate the human agency away from, the gods and the divine. And I'm not entirely sure that you can. I do agree that I think the Odyssey has more human agency, but for Zeus to just simply state like, you know, we told the justice not to do this and he did it. It's not our fault. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, I just don't, I, it's not a narrative I buy. No, no, no. I, I agree to that extent. I mean, it seems like a, a fairly minor more. What I was getting at though, was that there, there seems to be some real condemnation that what he has done is wrong. And that the the sacrifice is not going to make up for that. You're not going to please the gods by sacrificing, in this instance, just be, because they're not going to sanction what you've done. But that that said, I think there's another question. I mean, I don't know how to what extent a Homer and the the broader epics are trying to do this, but there's a kind of there's a kind of irony to Agamemnon here, with the question of what are you willing to sacrifice for Cleos? What are you willing to sacrifice for glory? But your glory is not complete until your the day of your homecoming right and the day of his homecoming ends in him being essentially sacrificed in the in a, an analogous way so he starts his 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 in order to achieve his kleos he sacrifices his daughter and having achieved it he becomes uh the sacrifice himself yeah, you see him there as a sacrifice of the wife for like her like who's he a well, sacrifice of in that in that narrative? Well, that's a good question. I mean, she she as I recall from the play, she he is um, killed in the bathtub. I'm either remember. bathing or at banquet. I don't remember. Yeah, I think he's. I think she's brought in, and he's like welcomed in. Like, oh, you know, there's a kind of ritual bath welcoming home the guest, or in this case, the the returning hero, and instead she. Um, she murders him. I don't know. I, um, there's also a. I will say there's a there's a a, a pride aspect to this. I, if I remember correctly, he he walks in on purple carpets that are supposed to be reserved. Like no no human should do this because it's it's too high. So I mean, there's lots of <laughs> lots of things going on in this story, and it's not the story we're reading. So it's also possible I'm just completely misremembering. 
but I, I think there's no. just an idea here that's just kind of I, I don't know what what Homer might be trying to teach us, but there's some Agamemnon certainly has this this tone of a cautionary tale. Let's just put it that way. No, I think so too. And like I said, I think it I think it runs parallel with the entire Odyssey. And as you see, even with the Telemachus, he starts to compare himself to Orestes. And then I think that later we'll see that Odysseus is influenced also by the narrative of Agamemnon. And to a certain well, what, degree, probably Penelope as well. Well, I think what you get in the gut, it's an unspoken contrast, because the exact manner of Agamemnon's homecoming is not uh, told here that I know of anywhere. But having, you know, knowing, as, as many people know the story, of, of the clandestine homecoming, uh, at least at first, of Odysseus, you couldn't have a stronger contrast between the one walking on uh, on a, uh, something that, that is sort of hubris itself to walk on something precious reserved for the for the gods versus someone coming in in rags and you, right. you, you and, and this is a contrast that the hearers at the time would have caught because they yeah, know no, Agamemnon's yeah, story and i think in a lot of ways too they know that it's odysseus that uh, brought troy down not agamemnon right and so i think that you talk about the glory and where that goes but it's interesting because Nestor, kind of going back to the text at like uh, 355 or so, Nestor actually ends this with even like a situational comparison saying, you know, boy, don't don't rove from your home too long, too far, leaving your own uh, holdings unprotected, right? Again, like this is just really pushed into Telemachus that, you know, you really need to look to Orestes and see what he did, you know, for his own home. And this situation with the suitors can go south, you know, very quickly. So let's see, we have Nestor and they're offering sacrifices and around, oh, 400, they're planning to go back to Nestor's uh, halls, I believe, right? Because they've been on this beach sacrifice uh, festival, if you want to call it that. And this is where um, Mentor, right, Athena, kind of tells them, you know, what they should do with the chariots and et cetera. And then to kind of just show them, you know, why they should do this, she decides to then transform into an eagle right in front of everybody and fly away, right? And so, I, you know, I think the point here, though, is that when she does this and does it in front of Nestor, Nestor then understands the gravity of what has happened in a way that I don't think Telemachus would, would really grasp, you know, by himself. So he understands this... Um, you know, theophany, if you will, uh, from the God, and immediately just goes into this, right? Uh, the old king was astonished. You know, dear boy, never fear. You'll, you know, never fear. You'll be a coward or defenseless, right? You have this goddess, you know, next to you, right? And he also sees this because his father was so favored by Athena as well. So he immediately starts counseling the boy in this divine favor that he has. And his piety also leads him into the sacrifice in which they're going to sheathe the horns, you know, of this cow in gold before they sacrifice it then to Athena. And so Athena hears his prayer, um, Nestor, you know, they kind of go through this whole sumptuous feast that they're setting up. It's notable in like 485 or so that Athena actually returns. And it says Athena came as well to attend her sacred rites. So Athena actually comes back with this kind of very positive um, notion, right, that um, Nestor's sacrifice is accepted and and also, you know, very good. And so they uh, kill the cow, they have the sacrifice, um, and, you know, they really kind of end the book. Uh, book three, I think, ends in a lot of ways of them obeying Athena, right? So they have this this feast, and then she's already told them what to do. You need to get the chariot together because Telemachus needs to go up to Sparta, right, and meet with Menelaus. And so that's how book three ends, is with them being obedient to the god that they just saw uh, in front of them. So yeah, questions, comments, book three of the Odyssey? No, I just wanted to add one, one point that, um, you know, is... Deacon, as you continue your Odyssey through the Odyssey with your guests, um, one thing we haven't really talked about, um, and, and again, it, it, 
this is only coming from a philosopher because I'm interested in questions involving epistemology. And so, you know, for your listeners slash viewers, um, so epistemology is the study of knowledge. Uh, you know, is knowledge possible? Where does it come from? And, you know, a close reading of Homer reveals that you know, Homer does have an epistemology at work. And, you know, he tends to preference or privilege knowledge that comes from firsthand experience. Hmm. And we do see that in, in Nestor's, well, you know, when, when Nestor is first addressed by Thrasymachus, uh, Thrasymachus instructs him to, to tell all that he has seen, and hence to tell the truth. And then a bit later, Nestor says, well, the rest of what I'm going to tell you, I've only heard from hearsay. And so it's interesting because, you know, even in the Iliad, in the famous book two catalog of the ships, where the, uh, the poet kind of breaks from the narrative and then addresses the muses again, he says something along the lines of, well, I want you to tell me, uh, you know, give me the list of all of the warriors. And But he says, um, you know, because you were there. And so, right. you know, as, as, as you're going through the Odyssey, I mean, there are going to be these moments. And, and are they terribly relevant to the narrative? Well, they may or may not be. But again, depending on what, what we're focusing on or what, what your readers are focusing on, Again, epistemologically, at least for the Homeric, you know, for 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 for, for Homer, um, knowledge, you know, it really seems to be identified with a kind of perceptual first person perspective. I was there. I saw it, and I mean that's also something that you see in Plato when when Plato is describing knowledge of the forms. The, the the knowledge verbs he uses often involve a kind of firsthand perception. I mean, you brought up the symposium early, Beacon, and you know what what is knowledge of the beautiful involve? Well, it's it's seeing it. I mean, right. it, you, it's it's akin to a visual. It's not visual. It's not empirical, but it's a kind of noetic sight. And so that's always been something that has interested me about Homer, even though he's not writing a treatise on epistemology. There, there does seem to be at least an understanding of, of knowledge as being principally something that one comes to have through personal experience. Yeah, that would kind of lend into, I think, why so many times there has to be confirmation of things through bird signs or the right. gods revealing themselves. Right. Well, how right. do you really know this? Like, what's true knowledge? Yeah, that's something I'd have to think about more. But there tends to be this, this, um, you know, physical confirmation. They see something right. that then lets them know. Yeah, the the one that sticks out to me there is, you know, King um, Priam with Troy when he has to go uh, ransom the body of Hector. He even has two. That's something that's always kind of intrigued me, right? He actually sees Iris, the goddess, come down and tell him exactly what he's supposed to do. Right. And then, like, five lines later, his wife is doubting, and everyone's doubting what he's doing. And so he prays to Zeus again for a bird sign, even right after telling his wife, I'm going to do this because I've seen the face of a god. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, he says a line very similar to that. I've seen the face of a god. And so what's interesting there is that I've always wondered when he does that second one and asks Zeus for a bird sign, which I thought Zeus was going to zap him with a lightning bolt or something for not having faith, because like, you literally just had a goddess face to face with you. I've always wondered if that then, um, talking about epistemology, if that was actually for his people and not for him, right? Because then they see the sign, like right. you're mentioning, they see the sign and then they say, oh yes, this is good, right? He can't tell right. them that he's seen the sign. So they have to see it for themselves. Yeah, that's you an interesting. Have, just don't take my word for it. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting, that's a really interesting note. Okay, good. Any other uh, questions on book three or any other comments? Well, uh, yeah. Um, rewinding to something Athena said in response to uh, Telemachus, where she said, uh, our quote here, yet 
death that's common to all, not the gods themselves, can ward off even from a man they love. And I think there's an, as we, you know, the Iliad had questions about mortality and immortality, and uh, you see Achilles in some sense at the, the arc of him ultimately accepting his mortality. And, the, and here we're going to have obviously, you know, coming forward uh, questions again. And there's an implication here that at least to the Greeks, to be immortal would then be to be something other than a man, right? You also see this, we see Tithonos mentioned as well. And I think, I mean, it just kind of a theme to carry forward is that while immortality might be offered, there seem, there, even Athena's speech here seems to imply that it would, it would mean to be something else, something, uh, at least in, within this context, something inhuman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's pretty good because, you know, I think we're going to get into that, you know, pretty heavily um, because next week we're going to get into book four, which is the king and queen of Sparta. And uh, Adam Minahan is going to host the podcast and talk to actually one of the Dominicans uh, from the East Coast is going to join him to work through that book. And then in book five which is when we finally get to find Odysseus, right? We finally understand where he is, and he finally makes his appearance. In book five, um, Adam and I are going to be joined by Evan, who runs Rewire the West, and he's going to help us, uh, which is on YouTube and Twitter. is a phenomenal resource for just kind of beautiful videos pulling from the great books, sacred tradition, etc. cetera. Uh, guy lives over in Italy. And so he's going to help us kind of work through book five. And I think that's really where that question of immortality, um, you know, kind of hits, hits its crux. So, no, very good. Any more questions or any comments on book three? Excellent. All right. Very good. Well, this is Ascend, the Great Books Podcast. We appreciate you joining us for our year with Homer. You can visit us at thegreatbookspodcast.com and Twitter or X. It's not Twitter anymore. It's X and YouTube. And we appreciate it. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you.